What do you think of when you hear the word polymath? If you're familiar with the term, you may think of Leonardo da Vinci, Benjamin Franklin, Jose Rizal, Picasso. But if you're not familiar with the term, a polymath is a person of wide ranging knowledge or learning. It could also be classified as a person of great learning in several fields of study. This isn't a video about the idolization of dead philosophers or me trying to convince you to build a rocket or learn 10 languages. It's about the encouragement of embracing new interests and presenting curiosity in a new life. Where did the shift of being great at one thing even come from? Why do we feel responsible for being the perfect this or the perfect that? Why is curiosity frowned upon rather than praised? People confuse curiosity with distraction, where I've found that curiosity is the catalyst for purpose and self-fulfillment. I truly believe everyone is a polymath. I feel that the curation of diversity and complex ideas moves society in a much more empowering way. Having an obsessive or passionate drive to create something bigger than yourself can help you navigate through unclear waters. But to do that, there is no way to know what your goal is before you know who you wanna be. Let me ask you this. What do you think your life would look like if no one told you you had to pick one single career path? As experts praise themselves further while computers slowly take over one-track-minded people's jobs, people who think broadly and embrace diverse experiences and perspectives will increasingly thrive. While there have been tons of philosophers that have created pathways and models to being their idea of a true universal human, one of my favorite graphs was curated and explained by technologist Ben Van Grift. He explains this idea of a Venn diagram. One side represents curiosity while the other side represents dedication. And where they meet in the middle is the dedication to curiosity itself. And as polymaths, we have to dedicate ourselves to this pursuit. And these are the two keys of learning like a polymath, curiosity and dedication. Now, most of us have been taught that curiosity and dedication are mutually exclusive. That in fact, curiosity is a distraction away from your dedication <clears throat> and it might kill your cat. While acknowledging the weights of both aspects, it's important to remember that this doesn't have to be balanced. As you start moving towards curiosity and as you start moving towards dedication, different learning strategies will unfold. Directed learning depends more heavily on dedication as opposed to curiosity. Historically, this looks like no other than Leonardo da Vinci. He was not only an amazing artist, but he was an engineer, an inventor, a mathematician, and so much more. He used what he already understood or knew and used that as a stepping stone to his next aspiration. When he wanted to learn to paint, he needed to go to the apothecary to get a few more materials. Then he saw the apothecary use the same method to mix medicine. After he got excited about learning medicine, he then moved to learning anatomy and physiology. On the other hand, Benjamin Franklin is the poster child for a opportunistic learner. He didn't have a lot of systems in place or patterns that he followed. He started with printing, then stenography, then cryptography, then wore cool wigs, helped to make a country, did oceanography, and messed around with electricity. He was as scatterbrained as they come. He was what you call an opportunistic learner, which is someone who is hungry to learn whatever's in front of them. And may it be a problem they want to solve or an intellectual itch, or they saw something that was neat and it excited them. As an opportunistic learner, you build this massive body of knowledge that isn't always intrinsically connected, but it's very broad and potentially you may have to learn every new thing from scratch. Whereas a directed learner, you use each subject as a stepping stone. As humans, we mix and match those learning styles based on our priorities at the time, but all the while we're learning new things. But regardless of how we stumble across a new creative endeavor, the diversity and widespread knowledge that we were eager enough to open ourselves to helps with critical thinking, problem solving, and primes ourselves for any variation of reality that life throws at us. I know we've all been in a situation where a teacher gives us a problem and we all as a class, as one unit, have to go about solving that problem the same way until we cannot get it wrong. Turns out this is a flawed way of teaching. It leads to immediate performance, but for knowledge to be flexible, it should be learned in varied conditions with an approach called mixed practice or in fancy science land terms, interleaving. 
So what studies have found is that instead of studying the same thing over and over and over, if you mix up or vary the challenge, the benefits are huge. In the moment, this process might be a lot more frustrating and you may even think that you're learning more slowly, but that's why it's so counterintuitive. Rather than practicing one type of problem over and over, mixing in different kinds of problems in between makes the process harder, but develops stronger skills. Ultimately, what's happening is that you are developing strategies to problems in a broad sense, instead of simply using a specific procedure. Your brain has to make abstract generalizations, which helps to make your knowledge more flexible. This method is used a lot on naval air simulations. People who engaged in high highly mixed practice performed worse than block practitioners during training. But during test time, everyone faces new scenarios and the mixed practice group outperformed the block practitioners by a lot. Peter Burke discussed the theme of multipotentialites in many of his works. He has presented a historical comprehensive overview of the increase or decrease of the polymath or what he identifies as an intellectual species. He observes that in ancient and medieval times, students did not have to specialize, therefore did not have to choose one career path, but rather trained with students in a small but diverse set of subjects. This universal education gave young students a grounding from which they can contribute fresh ideas to vast areas of accomplishments. Universal education was essential to achieving polymath ability. Hence the word university was used to describe a seat of learning. But going further back, the original Latin word universitas refers in general to a number of persons associated into one body, a society, company, community, guild, corporation, etc. However, from the 17th century, the rise of the Western world and need for more understanding of industries was making it difficult for individuals to master as many disciplines as before. This was because of the systemic investigation of the natural world and the flow of information coming from other parts of the world. As the world evolved, this presented new challenges, which required new responses. Naturally, a recession of the intellectual species was born. Burke argues that in light of specialization, polymathic people are more necessary than ever before. Given this change in the intellectual climate, it since has been more difficult to come across polymathic individuals that are courageous enough to mind the gap and draw attention to the knowledge that may otherwise disappear into the spaces between disciplines as they are currently organized and defined. Since we as a society have romanticized this idea of making our parents proud by choosing a stereotypical path or impressing our friends by having the best car or best house or high paying job, we subconsciously don't consider that being weird is the best progressive factors for our communities. History has been so unkind to multi-creative potentials that we are conditioned to see only a few forms of their varied achievements and squish them into a category that is digestible for an Instagram caption. Additionally, we have been trained to avoid looking intrinsically and even consider the fact that we are all polymath. A very common argument in this field is that only the greats like Benjamin Franklin or Leonardo da Vinci are polymaths and we can only live a life as an inspiring polymath, which totally makes sense, but guess what? Those guys are dead. And with that logic, the word polymath is dead. How can we aspire to be something that's extinct? That's like working hard at being a dinosaur. However, although I do believe we are all polymaths, I do believe we all have a lot to work on. I do believe that the first step is to create a healthy relationship with your inquisitive nature and value education to some degree. But I do think you should find a catalyst for growth. Maybe that could be joining your local boxing gym or learning how to do a pour over or watch more how-to videos on YouTube. It doesn't matter. But as long as it sets your soul on fire and stimulates interest and some bit of obsession, that's the kind of feeling that will move mountains. Our good friend Peter suggests that governments and universities should nurture a habitat in which this endangered species can survive, offering students and scholars the possibility of interdisciplinary work, which is a complex process that allows different types of staff to work together to share expertise, knowledge, and skills they found beneficial. It's been done, and guess what? It rocked. The modern education system 
actively discourages curiosity from an early age. And my contention is all kids have tremendous talents and we squander them pretty ruthlessly. These big ideas stayed small with a lack of social context or without an outreach to the greater community and all of its resources. If you think of it, children starting school this year will be retiring in 2065. Students need learning experiences across silos to be successful in our world. My contention is that creativity now is as important in education as literacy, and we should treat it with the same status. However, there are some schools that have recognized this and decided to make a change. One of my favorites I've heard of is Agora. This school in the Netherlands has no classes, no curriculum, no teachers. Rob, who is technically the manager and technically the closest thing to a teacher, describes Agora as a university where you have knowledge, a Buddhist monastery where you can think, a theme park where you can play, and a communal marketplace where you can trade and swap things. It's a school designed for learning, not teaching. But since we can't 100% trust that our public school system is going to provide this level of complexity as a baseline, and more than likely whoever is watching this video is past grade school, we're just gonna have to figure it out for ourselves. But how? Luckily, this dead guy has some pretty cool ideas that stood the test of time, and there are some more refreshing routes. There are a few principles that stood out to me in Walton Isaacson's biography of Leonardo da Vinci that deem themselves simple, but yet perpetually interesting. One of them, bear with me, is having a great physique. I said bear with me. I don't know if it's just me, but this sounds incredibly egotistical. But he believed the body is the carrier of the head. And therefore, having a good physique means you take pride in your health. Having a healthy mind, spirit, and body will allow for a clean mind to explore new interests. He also denoted an eloquent defense of procrastination. Men of lofty genius sometimes accomplish the most when they work the least, for their minds are occupied with their ideas and the perfection of their conceptions, to which they afterwards give form. And I love how this line stands on the opposite line of work culture. Procrastination can also exist as the word mind exploration. Exploration seems inefficient, but it is retrospectively more effective. Many have a drive to ensure they're seizing the day, but forget to account that taking the time to talk and synthesize is often the best time to bounce new ideas and make internal, worldly, and relational connections. There are a few sentences that David Epstein writes that encapsulates the journey of experimentation that is necessary to achieve higher interpersonal diversity. Don't feel behind. Begin to compare yourself to yourself yesterday, not to younger people who aren't you. Everyone progresses at a different rate, and the destination between two people is never the same. So don't let anyone else make you feel behind. Be fearlessly curious and approach your own path the way Michelangelo would approach a block of marble. Be willing to learn and adapt to any obstacles that may come in your way. And proudly abandon a previous endeavor if you entirely lose interest. Even when you move on from an area of work or even an entire domain, the experience is never wasted. Be a deliberate amateur. The word amateur did not originate as an insult, but comes from the Latin word amateur, a person who endures a particular endeavor. A paradox of innovation and mastery that breaks through when you start down a new road, but wander off for a ways and pretend you've just begun. Try new things, and it will make life a little more colorful. Also, I want to add there's nothing wrong with specialization. The problem is that people may be specializing in things they may not be passionate about. They may not be reaching their entire potential or they may not be living a full life due to lack of experimentation. I'm gonna be honest, I found the word polymath not too long ago. And this wasn't a journey of me identifying something and wanting to do more of that, but rather it was more of me saying, whoa, this is a word that describes my entire creative path and it's something worth discovering. We're all polymaths. Whether we have aggressively exercised that side of our lives or we are now discovering a more exploratory side, feeling confident in experimentation. My argument is that because of our humanity and because of our biological drive for fulfillment and innovation, and because we are not designed to do one thing and one thing only for the rest of our lives, we should feel more courageous and fearless stepping into the unknown. You never know what's on the other side of risk. 
but I can promise it's a story worth telling.